how you can use different dynamic languages on the Java virtual machine. Of course, the first question to ask is, why do we care? Right, Java is a fairly established language. It's been around for about 12, 13 years now. So why do we care to use any other language? So we're going to talk about some of the motivations to do that. And then we're going to talk about you know, what are some of the ways to actually approach it. So Java started out as being a very powerful but yet very simple language. I'm sure you remember reading about how simple Java is. And especially those of us who came from languages like C++, we had a breath of fresh air when we had to deal with not all that complexity, but actually get the work done. But what happened over the past uh, a decade or so is slowly but surely, the Java language itself has become somewhat complex. Uh, of course, one of the strengths of Java was not just the Java language, but the Java platform, right? We had this so-called write once, run anywhere. Personally, I like to call it as write once and debug everywhere, right? So we had the ability to write this code in once and then deploy it on different platforms. And of course, one of the strengths of Java is the platform itself, the API and all that we get from it. So the real strength of Java is no longer in the Java language. What's happened over the past 12 years is while the Java language has become more complex, the Java platform has become extremely strong, and that's where the real benefit is. But in the meantime, what's happened over the years is that we've been gaining interest on dynamic languages. Dynamic languages are certainly not new at all. We had them for several, several decades, actually. But what's happened over the past several years is that there is an excitement over dynamic languages for a number of different reasons. One is that machines have become faster. So we're able to actually deploy these dynamic languages fairly effectively. The second advantage that we have got is that even though the adoption has not been extremely high, at least the awareness of test-driven development has increased. So we are approaching the dynamic languages with a lot more sensibility than we did before, and that's definitely a, a, a good thing. A third probably factor is, uh, because of the internet boom, there's a lot more exposure to these languages, not, not only these languages though, but the development of these languages. One thing that's fantastic today that you could not have imagined about 20 years ago is that you actually, as a programmer, as a practitioner of this technology, can actually participate and influence the development of these languages. So if you're interested in you know, Ruby, for example, if you're interested in Groovy, for example, or any of the other languages, you could voice your concerns, voice your input, voice your, you know, uh, what you think about these things, and can participate and influence the development of these languages. And that is definitely a great deal of uh, you know, uh, uh, interest in the community to improve these languages as we go along. So with all that said, there is a definitely a new interest, and like I said, these are some of the reasons for some of the excitements around these. The, the fourth probably important reason to think about is the development of these killer applications. Of course, what I'm alluding to here is the excitement that Rails cost, for example, right? You're able to create these web applications very quickly and rapidly you know, develop this, get the feedback, which is extremely important for agile development, and then you're able to you know, carry on, and that has certainly a great amount of uh, you know, excitement and interest. So Java was this single language multi-platform, right? You would code in Java and deploy it in multiple platforms. While this was happening, .NET came about, and .NET is a multi-language single platform, right? Of course, you tell this to Microsoft, they will disagree, right? They'll say it's multi-platform. And you ask them how, and they say it runs on Windows NT, Windows 95, Windows 2000. Well, that's not quite the platform we talk about, but still, right, it's a, sing a multi-language single platform. One of the things that excites me about .NET is I have the freedom, the liberty to choose the language that I care the most about, right? If I'm more productive in one language versus the other, I can certainly use that and be productive. And while that was happening, to a certain extent, Java community, in terms of the Java JVM languages, was somewhat adamant about this one language. And then that's kind of changed over the past few years with an explosion of different languages on the JVM itself, which is, which is pretty good. So if you look at the Java, the true one language on the Java platform is the Java bytecode. But nobody's saying really writes bytecode, right? Unless you are extremely geeky and you sit there and keep writing bytecode, nobody does that. But the true one language is the, uh, the platform is the bytecode. But you could write the source code in different languages and have that compiled into this bytecode. And the advantage you have is today, there are over about 200 languages that run on the Java virtual machine. Right? So you could, of course, write your code in Java, which is a you know, good old traditional language. You could write code in JRuby. Right? Now, talking about JRuby just for a second, 
Uh, Ruby, of course, runs on the native platform, right? You can call this the MRI implementation, the Mods Ruby implementation. So you could just run it on your native platform, whatever that platform is. Or you could run the code in JRuby, and your Ruby code then runs within the JVM. Or you could take your Ruby code and run it in Iron Ruby, and that runs within the CLR. So as of today, Ruby is probably the only language that crosses across all these different platforms, right? You can use it on the native platform. You can use this on JVM. You can use this on the CLR. So that certainly has a good amount of strength. Uh, GUI is another interesting language that's evolved over the past, you know, about four or five years. Now, GUI came from the basis of a lot of these excitements around these dynamic languages and the productivity gains. But the goal of Ruby was to provide a fairly seamless integration with Java. So if you are a Java programmer, you should be able to code in GUI without having to take a very steep learning curve. In fact, one of the things I really like about GUI is almost all Java code is also GUI code. So you could just sit there and write Java code run it through Groovy, and as you become, so to say, groovier, you could start refactoring your code into a lighter weight syntax and take advantage of these features of Groovy, like meta programming and so on, and that's the incredibly uh, powerful. JavaScript, you can integrate your code with JavaScript as well, and you could write some parts of the application in JavaScript and rest of the application in Java and intermix them. And similarly, Jython, which is a Python implementation of the JVM, Jaskell, which is a Haskell implementation of JVM, and so on. So there are all these different languages that you could actually use on the Java virtual machine. So this gives you a great amount of flexibility where you can choose the language that gives you the power, right? Now, why would I want to be using these different languages, right? Um, well, we are already using multiple languages. You write code in SQL, right? You write Java code, you write HTML. And so there are different languages that are better for different you know, types of things. But if I want to do meta programming, I find that it's insanely simple and easy for me to do it in languages like Groovy and JRuby. If I want to take advantage of some of the functional programming capabilities, I could do that in Scala, or I could do that on Jasco, and then still take advantage of the power of the Java virtual machine. So it, it, about four years ago or so, the, the choice was not so good. If I did not want to just still sit with Java, but I had to take advantage of these other things, that simply meant immigration, right? I had to leave behind the Java virtual machine in the platform and go start doing other languages and other things. But when you did that, the disadvantage was you leave behind the wealth of the power of the platform and then all the knowledge that you have with it and all the benefit you have with it. Well, the choice is much better today. You don't have to emigrate to another platform at all. You could still be there in the same platform. You could take advantage of the power of the platform. But more important, all the richness of the API that you have taken the time to learn and practice, and yet sit there and take advantage of these other languages and intermix them. And that is the beauty of this, that you have a greater power on your hand. And after all, at the end of the day, Everybody fundamentally wants this freedom, right? We want the freedom to do the right thing and not be constrained by other things, and this gives us a lot more freedom in what we do. So multi-language means what, really, in that case? You can, uh, you can take a higher level language, and you can compile this into a bytecode. And that's not new, really, right? That's been around for quite a while. But this means interoperability. I could write a code in any of these languages but the code you write is a first-class citizen. It's not deprived and saying, oh, you came from this other language, so you're of a lesser of an object. That's not true. Doesn't matter which of these languages you wrote the code in, it's as much a first-class citizen as it was written in the pure Java language. So as a result, you can take this code, you can intermix this code with other different languages, and that gives you a lot more mobility and power on your hand, and that is something that's incredibly uh, you know, powerful and useful. Uh, you can inherit a class from a class created in this other language. Because at the end of the day, the code is in bytecode. That's what really matters to you, right? You can associate with these other classes. You can aggregate with these other classes. You can do anything you want to do with them as if that code was written in the Java language itself, because that, that's the whole intent. You can intermix them very easily as well. So, but why mix the dynamic languages? I alluded to this already quite a bit. Dynamic languages, one of the beauties of dynamic languages is it gives you this incredible power of metaprogramming. Metaprogramming is where you can write code that can extend itself at runtime, giving you a greater mobility and agility in your application. Uh, certainly, you know, yes, that's kind of scary for some of us. Like, my goodness, how could you have code that kind of evolves as time goes on? 
But again, with that flexibility, if you practice it with a certain amount of you know, discipline, then it becomes quite effective where you can take advantage of that, and that is something. And, and, and later on, uh, I'm going to do a workshop, about uh, three plus hours of workshop this afternoon, on how to create DSLs. And I'll talk a lot more about meta programming and how you can do that in that particular talk. So I'll just mention this here, and I'll move on. It's a great power to create this. Uh, it improves the productivity, right? At the end of the day, I don't want to sit there and code for seven hours and only produce code that was worth an hour of effort, right? I want to be able to be very productive. And these dynamic languages give me a great amount of productivity in what I'm trying to do. And that is a great advantage. Uh, you can also have the users to be more expressive. And again, that advantage comes to you from the DSL itself, because it gives you a greater expressiveness. You can also have rule-based systems. You can write and implement these things very effectively in your code. So there's like all these different advantages that you know, go on and on in terms of these dynamic languages. But of course, I want to be able to still take advantage of the platform, and that's where the real, uh, real nice thing is. So you want to be able to interoperate very easily with the Java language, the Java JDK, the Java API. And here's where the beauty is. You can do this now. So what you can do is you can write your code in different languages. I just picked one example because uh, uh, the language Groovy, excuse me, mainly because I've been working with Groovy a lot more recently. It doesn't mean that that's, a, that's the only language you can use. Like I said, there are so many different languages. I'm just picking one example here. You could write your code in Groovy, and then you could use a Groovy shell, and you can communicate that with a Java code. So using a Java code in Groovy code, there's absolutely no effort at all. It just works, right? And you can also write your Groovy code. You can compile your Groovy code into Java bytecode and then use it with other Java code. And again, that just works. And if you want to be in the Java side and if you want to talk to Groovy, there are a couple of different ways to do it. You could compile your Groovy code into Java code. Then Java code can call into Groovy code just like it calls into any other Java code. Or you can use this JSR223, which allows you interoperability between different languages. And in terms of Groovy itself, that would be the least preferred way of doing it. Because one of the strengths of Groovy is it gives you an incredible amount of you know, interoperability with Java. But if you're not using Groovy, if you're using JRuby or if you're using you know, JavaScript, JSR223 is an option. You can use that to communicate fairly effectively as well. So all these are power on your hand, and you can certainly benefit from them. So that's enough of talking. Let's just take a look at some examples. Let's say I want to write JavaScript. JavaScript is an extremely powerful language, right? It's, it's a dynamic language. It gives us a lot of productivity. A lot of us use JavaScript when it comes to a web application, but it doesn't have to be limited to doing that. If you want to use JavaScript, you can certainly use that uh, it, on your virtual machine as well. So let's take a look at an example here. Let's just start with this little example of a JavaScript I'm going to create over here. So what I'm going to do is to simply just show you that this is pure, simple JavaScript, the good old JavaScript that we know about, right? So what I'm going to do here is, um, is to run a little tool here that can help me run JavaScript. So basically, I'm going to use my jrun uh, run script, which is a tool that comes with Java 6. Uh, if you're not using Java 6, you can download this in Java 5 separately, and you can use this. And you can write language code in different languages. By default, it uses JavaScript, but you can also give a minus L option and tell them to use a different language like Groovy and what have you. I won't go into much of the detail about that right here, but I'll just go, you know, show you an example. So let's say I want to create a, a function called car. Now, those of you who know uh, JavaScript know this also creates a class for you. So I set the miles to zero, right? And all that I did was I just created a type over here. So then I'm going to say car dot prototype dot uh, you know drive equals function, and then I'm going to give it a distance. And I'm simply going to say, of course, it's a very trivial, simple example, and I'm going to just add that to the distance, right? So all that it was a wrote a function which takes a distance, adds it to the miles, the distance given to me, and that's all I did so far. So then what I'm going to do is to say my car equals new car, just creating an object of my car. And I'm going to say my car dot drive, and I'm going to drive it 10 miles, right? So there, there, there I added that. Now I can say print uh, my car dot miles, and notice they printed a 10 over there. That's a very simple example showing you how JavaScript works. Not a, nothing new, really, right? Just to show that it's pure, simple, good old JavaScript that I was using, no magic behind the scene, right? But what I can do then is, is this. Uh, let's take a look at an example of a little JavaScript I want to create over here. And what I'm going to do in this JavaScript is to go a little bit further. Let me make this a bit more bigger for you to see it. So what I'm going to do here is to say list equals 
new java.util.array list, right? Now, this is the good old Java util array list that we are familiar with. I'm just creating an object of that. Uh, and then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, uh, with list, and I'm going to ask him to add something to it. So I'm going to say add a 1, and then go ahead and add a 2. And then I'm going to say print line, and I'm going to ask him to print the size of the list. When he's done, I'm going to ask him to print line, uh, let's say, uh, list dot get class dot get name to see what he really is, right? So that is, that's probably a font that's too big for you to see. So let me lower that a little bit here. Um, okay, so that's the code I have so far. Is I, I just simply asked him to go add this to the list, and, and that's all I have done, right? Very simple code. But notice what this, the difference is. I'm talking to the good old Java API, right? The Java util array list. But I'm talking to it not from the good old Java, but I'm talking to it from JavaScript. But this JavaScript is special. Why? Because the JavaScript is going to run within the Java virtual machine. So when I execute this code, it's going to get compiled into the Java bytecode, and then it's going to get executed on the Java virtual machine itself. So let's go ahead and just give that a try. So I'm going to go ahead and run this tool right here and specify this test.js. And right there, you saw the output, right? The size of the list is 2, and you're still dealing with the Java util array list as the output. So that's how simple it was to talk from JavaScript into the Java itself. Again, that's just one example, right? If you're writing code in Groovy, if you're writing code in JRuby, there are much more easier way to communicate. Here's an example for you. So if I want to talk to this from Groovy, look at how incredibly simple this is. This is Groovy code. So I'm going to say print, and I'm going to say, you know, hello, Groovy, right? So execute this right here, and that is simply saying, hello, Groovy. That's pure Groovy code. But here's what I could do. I could say list equals 1, 2, and 3, and I'm going to print the list over here and execute that code, and it's printing the list. Now, if I want to get the last element of the list, how do I do that? I'm going to say print line list, and then I'm sure you've done something like list dot size minus 1 and so on, right? But if you think about it, that's incredibly stupid, right? You go to the list, ask for the size, then subtract the one only to get the last element. If you do that, if you do that to a real human, he will strangle you, right? Because you want to be more intelligent when you deal with this. So what Groovy does is it says, hey, simply just tell me that the last element is what you're looking for. And notice I'm just giving a minus 1, and that gives me the last element in the list. Now, so that's a much more elegant, lightweight, low ceremony syntax. While you're doing this, you're curious, what in the world am I dealing with? And you realize what you're dealing with is nothing but your good old Java util array list, right? So that is Groovy code that is talking to Java, but that's pure low ceremony. You're not sitting there and fighting the API and the syntax. The syntax has been much more easier and simplified. The API has been enhanced. But at the end of the day, you're still talking to the good old Java API on the Java platform, and your life is a lot more easier. So that is just an example of talking to Java from within Groovy, as I, as I showed you over here. So those are some of the different ways to approach communicating with your code. So that's the example I just showed you a minute ago. Um, so, but again, another one, and one of the other things that I really like about mixing these languages is the idiomatic difference. You know, one of the things that I really found out is, you know, we all know English, we all speak English. Yeah, we speak English differently depending on where you are from, but when I go into a different country, even if they may be speak, speaking English, what gets me into real trouble is not the English they speak, but the idioms that they use, right? Each one of us have their own, our own idioms, right? In my mother tongue, I have idioms, right? And when I go and speak in English, they speak until they use an idiom, I'm totally lost. It's like, what does that mean? The, the problem with the idiom is, you cannot take the words that make the idiom, translate that into your own mind and say, that's what it means, and you realize it doesn't mean that, right? So where, does, where do idioms come from? Idioms come from a lot of cultural, influ cultural influence, right? You cannot just apply grammar and understand what an idiom means. There's a lot of cultural influence in it. Now, that is the beauty of these different languages. Each of these languages have their own idiomatic way of doing things. And when you mix these languages, yes, you are talking to the Java API, but no, I'm not going to talk to the Java API like a Java code will be talking to the Java API. I'm going to be using an idiomatic syntax in that language to talk to the Java API. And that is where the real fun is. Let me show you an example of what I mean when I say that. So if you look at this example code of talking to Swing, 
You know, yes, you can write the swing code in Java and talk to the swing code in Java, but if you notice, the real icing on the cake is where I have button.action listener, right? Uh, when I say add action listener right there, those of you who have dealt with the action listener interface, remember what you have to do. First of all, you have to implement an anonymous inner class, right? And then you have to provide an action performed method. To the method, you have to send action event, which you don't care anyways to use. And that is called ceremony, right? And you sit there and write the code. You shrug and say, that's life in the big city, and you still write the code. Now, notice how that code transformed itself here in JavaScript. You simply said function, and then you say my label dot text equals hello, and you simply gave a function, and JavaScript says, sit back, relax, I know what you're doing, I'll take care of it. I will take this function, transform into something that implements that interface, which is the action listener interface. I will write the method, which is action performed. I will fill in the gaps and the holes for you and send this over there, right? So notice how idiomatically you're still talking to your Java API, but the syntax is a lot more lighter and, 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 and easier to use, and you're using an idiomatic Java syntax to talk to it right here, rather than doing the you know, code like you'd normally do it in, in, in Java itself. And that is one of the things that excites me the most when I mix these languages is I can take advantage of the strong platform, but I can also take advantage of this idiomatic capabilities and strengths that, is, that I get from these different languages. So that's just an example of talking to the Java Swing API from JavaScript itself. Um, you can also do this from Groovy, but you can notice how this, different, this code is different, even though it does something very similar to it, because I'm using the idiomatic syntax of Groovy here to do this. One of the beauties of Groovy is, Groovy gives you DSLs, domain-specific languages, to create and interact with various things. They give you what are called these builders, and what you're seeing here is an example of a builder that I'm using in Groovy to go talk to the Swing API itself. And again, you're still talking to the good old Swing API, but you're talking to it very differently here in Groovy. And that, that, again, is an advantage. You can get your work done very quickly, but at the same time, taking the advantage of the platform you already have access to. So how do you call JavaScript from Java? So now I'm turning around the table, right? I showed you how to go from JavaScript to Java. I showed you how to go from Groovy to Java. Now I'm interested in saying, hey, I want to go from Java to these other languages. The first question is, why in the world do you want to do that, right? The reason is, if I can write code in Groovy, I can write code in Ruby, I can write code in JavaScript, what have you, maybe I'll find that I can do something very expressively in these languages. Or maybe I find that it's incredibly easy for me to create a DSL in these languages. And then at the end of the day, I say, OK, that's all great, but I still have to get my Java application built. So how do I write my rest of the code in Java but then go back and use these features in these other languages, and I have to interrupt it back and forth, right? So you want to write your code in Java, but they can take advantage of these things from other languages. How can you do that? Once again, Groovy gives you quite a different options to do it, but I'm going to look at this more from the Java point of view rather than Groovy point of view and show you a couple of different ways to do this. So let's go back here and give it a try. So what I have done over here is a very darn simple Java code, right? It's got a class with the main with nothing in it, and I'm going to go talk to Groovy from here, right? So how do I do that? Again, like I said, there are better ways to do this in Groovy itself. But if you say, hey, I don't want to talk to Groovy. I want to talk to JavaScript. Hey, I don't want to talk to Groovy. I want to talk to JRuby. The code I'm going to show you here is going to be almost the same uh, for talking to these other languages, right? So how do I do that? So what I'm going to do here is, first of all, this is part of the um, um, JSR223 API. And I'm going to say, get me a, a script. Uh, engine manager, right? So a script engine manager basically is a class that is going to allow me to talk to a script engine. Oops. Uh, so basically in this case, what I'm going to do is to talk to the script engine manager. That's what I'm going to do. So let's say I want to talk to the script engine manager, and uh, I'm going to say what? I'm going to say get me a script engine, right? So, um, so let's go ahead and create an object of him. Uh, let's me go ahead and say new for this guy. Um, and then once I get that, I'm going to say dot, and I'm going to say get script engine. Uh, so there are a couple of ways to get a script engine. You can say get, get script engine by name, and I can say JavaScript, or Groovy, or JRuby, or whatever you do, you could say that. Or you could say get script engine by extension, and you could say dot Groovy, or dot RB for Ruby, and so on. So based on the extension, you can get the engine. Or you can give other things also. Now why would you do that? So maybe you're, you have an application, and you're receiving scripts dynamically while the code is executing. 
you don't want to really worry about what the script is. You simply get the script and say, hey, based on what the script is, we'll figure out what engine to use and load it up. Of course, there are other things you have to do behind the scene to make sure that the script engines are in your class path and so on. But assuming you can take care of all those issues, you can make this code fairly dynamic. So I'm going to say get the script engine by name, and I'm going to ask for a Groovy script engine over here. right? So once I got the Groovy script engine, the next thing I want to do here is to simply go ahead and you know, use this particular script script engine over here. So let's say this is going to be engine. That's the name I give for him, right? So I got the engine right there. So what do I do once I get the engine? Let's start with something very trivial. Engine dot, I'm going to simply say eval, and I'm going to give him a script. Now, of course, in a real life, I would not hard code my script in this code. But this is just a demo, and I'm too lazy today to write another file and read that file and write 30 lines of code in Java to read the file. So I'm just going to put this right here, right? But in real life, I wouldn't put the code here. It would be an external file. So what am I going to do? I'm going to simply say print line. You know, I'm going to say here, uh, hello from Groovy, right? So because this is Groovy code, I'm going to say print line, hello from Groovy. And I'm just going to go ahead and execute this little code that I just wrote right here. So let's go run that and see what it does. And uh, so um, notice that it said hello from Groovy, right? But what's the big deal about this? The big deal about this is that little code you wrote actually run, was run as a Groovy code. You could look at that and say it doesn't look like a Groovy code. Well, that's just Groovy code, right? As simple as that is, but you're going to write a little bit more in a minute. So what if this code is going to return some response or results back to me? Well, you can certainly do that too. So I'm going to say return you know, uh, things over here. So this is going to return a thanks message back to me. And, uh, and in Groovy, a return is optional. So if I just said thanks also over here if I, if I wanted to do that. So basically, in this case, I'm going to put that value as a result over here. And notice that I stored that into a result. Now I can output over here uh, back in Java. right? So back in Java, uh, I have, and I'm going to just put the result that I got over here. So if I execute this little code now, uh, let's see what this does. Um, there we go. Back in Java, I have thanks, right? So that was very simple. I called into Groovy, Groovy executed, it returned some results back to me, I captured the result back on the Java side, and I printed it. So this tells me that I can have a conversation with this code, right? Send a, send a request over there, get it executed, get the response back and print it, or do whatever I want to do, or take the response and send it back to another function and so on. OK, that was simple. That was just a pure script that I sent to him. What if this is not just a little script like this? What if this is a little bit more than a script? How do I do that? Well, let's go ahead and write a little function and, and see how that's going to work. right? So what I'm going to do here is to create this little function. Uh, let's get rid of this for a second. So what I'm going to do here is to simply say uh, you know, evaluate, and I'm going to write a function called greet. So let's go ahead and throw that away. And I'm going to say uh, define a function called greet, which takes a name as a parameter, right? So that's my greet function. So what's a greet function going to do? The greet function is going to print out. I'm going to say print line, and uh, in the print line, I'm going to say um, you know hello, and let's print the name. So right there's the name, right? And end of that. So again, like I said. Uh, in reality, I wouldn't put the code here. So as a result, the syntax wouldn't look as ugly with these escaped characters in, the, in it. But since I'm just putting the code here, I have to do that. right? So that is my greet that's, that's right there. But, but the problem with this code is, if I execute this code, there is no real code for it to execute. right? Why? Because what I gave him is a function, and there's nothing for him to run at this moment. i got to come back and call that function greet. Not only call this function greet, but I also want to send the name to it, right? So how do I do that? Well, this is where you could use uh, invocable interface. So basically, I'm going to say invocable. Um, so right there is invocable. And so once I got this little invocable interface, what I would like to do is to go ahead and provide that implementation. Right there, my uh, tool is a little bit misbehaving. Let's, uh, there we go. I knew that was going to do it. OK, so what I'm going to do here is to simply go to the invocable interface, get the engine, and I'm going to go ahead and put that into an invocable interface itself. That's good enough for now. So now I'm going to come to the invocable, right? I, I evaluated the engine, and now I'm going to say, now well, let's say invocable dot. And uh, well, let's just execute the engine. Now I'm going to come and call this, right? So how do I do that? Um, so I'm going to say here, invocable dot. And there are a couple of different options. You can either invoke a function 
or you can invoke a method. The difference is, uh, because Groovy allows you to write classes, but Groovy also allows you to write scripts, if a class has a function, obviously we use the word method for it. If a script has a function, you use the word function for it. So that's the difference here. Whether you want to call a function written in a script, or you want to call a function written in a class, that's the difference here. So I'm going to go ahead and say invoke a function, because that's what I want to call here. And I want to call the function greet, and I'm going to send the name over here. I'm simply going to send the name Venkat over here, right? So that is my little code to exercise that little method we wrote, the greet method we wrote up there. And you can see that it printed hello Venkat. Now, of course, I could, I, I, we just saw how to send a parameter and call a function just like how the other one returned value, if this function is going to return a value, you can receive that as a uh, response to the call to the, uh, to the invoke um, uh, for method function or invoke function function, and then receive that and process it. Uh, now, of course, this takes a hit that every time you call the script, it is going to compile the script into the Java bytecode and execute it. And if that becomes a concern to you, you could then scale up to using what's called a compilable interface. A compilable interface allows you to take a script, compile that script, and then reuse that compiled script in your, in your memory so you don't have to take the hit of recompiling or re, re this code every time you're invoking this particular call, and that can become a bit more easier. So I just showed you that example right here of how to go talk to this, and I mentioned about and give you an example of the invocable interface, and then I also mentioned the compilable interface that you could use. So, like I said, this is just an example of different languages that you could use, but I'm going to go a little bit further and show you one example of why I may want to do something like this, which is to use the Groovy language. Groovy simplifies a lot of these things, and Groovy pro provides you a join compilation. So what you could do in Groovy is this. I'll just show you a very quick example of this here. Let's say I have, uh, let me open up a little terminal here. Let's go to um, um, a little, um, Oh, let's say, um, OK, so let me go to this directory here. And um, so I'm going to just create a little, little trivial example and show you how this can work. Um, so let me uh, create a file called, uh, you know, uh, test.groovy, right? So uh, here's test.groovy that I've created. And what I'm going to do in this test is let's keep it extremely simple. I'm going to create a little code and say print line uh, hello uh, from Groovy, right? Extremely trivial. And I'm just running this here as Groovy itself. So how do I run this code? I could simply say Groovy and run the code right here, right? That's like running it as a Groovy. But Groovy is a language on the JVM. So you could say Groovy C, just like you do Java C, you could do Groovy C, right? And I'm going to just compile this right here. And now if you notice, I've got a class file sitting in there, right? So I just compiled this into a Java bytecode. Once you have done this, that bytecode is a first class citizen. As much as you are Java compiled bytecode, this is Groovy compiled bytecode, right? So at the end of the day now, it is just Java bytecode. So I want to run this. Well, of course, because it has a few of the grooviness in it, I need to just add other few jars to it. So I'm going to run Java minus class path. And I'm going to specify the Groovy class path to bring in the Groovy libraries to it. And then I'm going to simply run the test, right? So that is the code running as a Java code, right? So I just say Java and give it the class path and execute it. So I took the code in Groovy and then ran it as Java code. So notice how simple that was to just write the code and run it as Java. Well, you could write this code in different classes now. So then you can compile them into Java bytecode. And then you can use it in your Java code. How do you use it in Java code? Just like you use Java code in Java code, right? So if you're using Java util array list, what do you do? You say do new Java util array list. You'll, here you'll say new and whatever the class that you created in Groovy, just specify it here. And Java says, I don't care. That's a byte code. I love byte code. I, I eat them for breakfast. It just executes that at the time, right? doesn't care. And that's how simple it is. So you can go very easily from Java to Groovy because Groovy compiles into Java bytecode, right? So the Groovy Java integration story is a much more uh, well integrated, right? And it's much more easier to use it. So you've got a win-win situation in that. That's one of the things I really like about Groovy is a nice uh, integration. But then in, Gro in Groovy 1.5, they, they went a step further. Now, if you take a directory with a bunch of Java files, let's say you have 10 Java files, and you just compile one Java code, 
Java compiler does you a favor, right? It says, hey, wait a minute, that Java code uses this other Java code. I might as well do you a favor and compile that as well, and it compiles all the dependent classes for you. Well, I'll tell you what, that's really good and nice of Java compiler to do it, but it stops right there and only does this for the Java comp code. It doesn't care about other language code. Obviously, it doesn't know about other language code. It doesn't do it. So what they did in GUI 1.5, is they introduce the join compilation. So when you compile your GUI code with the, with the join compilation option, the GUI code recognizes that a GUI, uh, the GUI compiler recognizes that your GUI code is using a Java code. Now this is a bit more complicated, right? Because your GUI code may be using a Java code, and a Java code may be using a GUI code. This is called a chicken and egg problem, right? How do you know which, which way to go? And these guys did something extremely smart. So what these guys did, is they, first of all, realize, aha, uh -huh, if my Groovy code needs the Java code, I better go compile the Java code. But wait a minute, but if the Java code needs my Groovy code, what do I do? So they go through a smart phase where they recognize what code the Java code is using, and they create a shell of these class definition without any implementation, right? And then they kind of send it to Java and fool it and get that part compiled. And then they come back to the Groovy side, and then compile the Groovy code, and then everything comes back to a Java class. So, you know, pretty smart people, right? They, they kind of look at what's going on with the interdependency, and they figure this out and solved it. So as a result, now you can have your Groovy code compile, not only Groovy code, but also Java code. You have a join compilation. Groovy is probably the only language that actually is capable of doing this join compilation. And don't underestimate that capability, right? Because when you're writing these and mixing these languages together, your life is a lot easier because you can use these languages and work with it very effectively in getting your work done without struggling through the deployment and the compile compilation and so on that you have to worry about. So um, using Groovy with Java, I'm going to uh, uh, show you an example of how to do this. So notice I have a class called Groovy class, just to make the name very obvious. And what does it do? Something very trivial. It says, you know, greet, and it prints out hello. That's all it does. Now, notice there's a use class. Use class is in traditional Java, right? When looking at it, you know it's Java code because it looks, you know, quite cumbersome. It's got a lot of these traditional methods in it. So the use class is simply in the main creating an object of the GUI class, and I'm just calling object.greet. But notice my GUI class is GUI class, obviously. I'm going to compile it using GUI. My use class is Java class. I'm going to compile it using Java. So notice what I have done. I compiled Groovy C with the minus J option, right? So I said minus J. Minus J option is for join compilation. And I specified the use class dot Java and Groovy class dot Groovy. I gave it both of those. Now I, I, when, when this is done, Groovy compiler smartly compiled the Java code using Java. Now what I would encourage you to do is if you do this, go back and take a look at what it created. And there's a beautiful tool that you could use to kind of poke in and look at what's going on. And that and the tool is called um, Java P, right? So Java P is an awesome tool. Java P takes the bytecode and reverse engineers and show you in a way that you can actually read and understand. And if you go and take a look at what code it spit out at, at the class level, you will see the Groovy compile code will have Groovy stuff in, in it in addition to the Java stuff. But the Java code will be pure Java code compiled by a Java compiler. And the point I'm making is the Java code was not compiled as Groovy code. The Java code was compiled as Java code, and the Groovy code was compiled as Groovy code. And it's good to kind of take a look at it and understand what's going on, and it's fun to kind of dig a little bit deeper and be curious about it. So, so then what I do here is I run the Java code, notice, right? I say Java minus class path, and then I run the use class, and it produces the output for me. So I ran this code that I compiled in Groovy, and then ran it as Java code, and I'm intermixing. The point I'm making is, if you want to talk from Java to Groovy, don't have to use ASR223. So the example I showed you a few minutes ago is useful for other languages, but you're not, comp excuse me, you're not compelled to use it for Groovy itself, because Groovy has a better integration story. Now, what, where can we go with this? I'm going to show you a very small DSL. This is a domain-specific language that represents a game with scores. If you show this to somebody, right, what are they going to say when they look at it? They're not going to say that is code, right? They're going to look at it and say, that looks like a data file, right? And indeed, it is a data file. 
But a data file can be executed as a DSL, and, and th this in this case it's purely an internal DSL. So I can compile this very effectively in Groovy, and then that's what I'm going to show you how to do that right here. So let's give it a try. So what I'm going to do here is to say something like, you know, uh, players, and I'm going to say Sam, and then let's just put, you know, Jim. That's good enough, two players, maybe three players, and let's say, you know, Jake. And I'm going to say Sam, and then let's say 10, uh, Jim is 11, and Jake is 9 as the scores. And then I'm going to say report, right, scores. Um, so right there is, is a little file that I want to execute. Now obviously if I try to run this code, I'll get an error because it doesn't have a clue what this all means, right? But this is a pure DSL. And then Groovy makes it extremely simple to run these kinds of DSLs. Uh, and uh, so as a result, you can pick this DSL and simply run it. I'm not going to start Groovy. The process.groovy is the one that's going to crunch this DSL. And I'm going to write this in Groovy. And then I get the file itself, put them together, and I say evaluate. So the Groovy shell is just evaluating that, and it's going to give me the result back. Now, of course, I want to use this from Java, right? Because I'm writing this DSL, processing it, but I want to run this in Java. Notice how I'm going to use this in Java. So I say use uh, DSL. Here's my main. Creates a DSL evaluator, and simply calls DSL evaluator.evaluate, and then sends the scores.dsl, right? So notice how I've tied all of these. The only missing link here is what does the DSL evaluator do, right? What does that method do, uh, that, that particular class do? Well, we'll take a look at that in just a minute. So that's the code right here. Uh, what I've done in this particular case is, this is Google Groovy code. Don't worry about the details here, uh, unless you're interested in writing DSLs. And this is uh, basically you know, taking the players, interpreting what the player names are. Uh, report score is going to get the report back to you, and a couple of other things. What, what is the benefit I have here? Well, my goal is to write a DSL. Like I said, don't worry about how to write a DSL. That's an implementation detail, right? Just so abstract it out, look at the forest. Well, I want to write DSLs. Well, I have this knowledge that writing DSL, internal DSL is easy in a dynamic language like Groovy and JRuby and so on. So I'm going to write my Java code, but I'm going to take this Groovy and say, hey, Groovy, do me a favor. You are better at running these internal DSLs, so go run this internal DSL for me. When you're done, give me the result back. Am I making sense? So you're just saying, I'm going to delegate this responsibility to you. So my Java code wakes up, calls upon Groovy code, and says, go process the DSL, get me the result back. So now I've shown you how you can write Java code and how to write Groovy code and mix them together. So you can write your code in Java, but in places where you can take advantage of the Groovy or other languages, you can kick in and take advantage of those also and get the processing done. So that is an example of how you can benefit from mixing these languages together. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, as to the capability of these languages, why mix these dynamic languages, what they do for you. So where we are today is the, the world has moved on to realize that we need to be accommodative of different ways. The productivity comes from applying different skills and different languages and different capabilities. Now, one of the surprising things is, while we are fighting our way through to be productive, some of these concepts have been around for 40, 50 years. Dynamic languages are not new at all, right? Dynamic languages have been around for several decades. Functional programming have been around for several decades. But it's just that we don't have the capability to you know, use those effectively in a lot of things we do. If you think about when object-oriented programming was first introduced, right? It was introduced in 1967, right? That's a long time ago. OOP was introduced in 1967. Most of us got excited about it. Not all of us, but most of us got excited about it in the late 80s to early 90s. Well, what's the reason for it? Because suddenly we realized we could take our C programs and run them through a C++ compiler, right? And we're like, hey, look at this. I could write object code in a language that I use for my own work. So when that happened, then there was a mass adoption of OOP. So it took about more than 20 plus years for that to be accepted and adopted. So until mainstream languages can kind of you know, start taking advantage of these things, these are languages that either are of academic interest or interest in a very small community of developers. Now what's happening you know, in the year 2000 and, and, and in this decade is, I would say this is the decade of dynamic languages, right? We get excited about saying, hey, look, I could actually run a code using these dynamic languages on the JVM. And what's really exciting, if you ask me about two years ago, what I think, I would say, I think it's a bit boring. But it's now exciting, right? Because you can mix these languages, take advantage of it. 
What's still ahead is these functional languages, right? So uh, functional programming is something out there. It's been around for several decades, but still we haven't taken advantage. But the processor and the things that's changing around us is going to force us towards that path. And so it's an exciting time to see language evolution. It's exciting time to see how the JVM is also evolving to accommodate some of these things. So overall, I think we've got to be a bit open and see how we can mix these together and take advantage. So I think it's a best of the time to be in the language community and see how we can benefit from these. So that's all I have. I want your questions, comments, just about anything on your mind. Please. So the question is, Java has been around for a long time. It's very powerful. It's mature. Groovy is trying to catch up. What does it mean to Java? That's a question, right? OK. So well, first of all, no doubt that Java is mature. But I want to emphasize that as much as the Java language is mature, the Java platform is a lot more mature. So the strength in Java is good to know, but the real strength is also on the Java platform. Um, I wouldn't say Groovy is catching up, right? Because Groovy can do everything that Java does, but what Groovy is trying to do is to bring you the dynamic productivity and the meta programming. Yes, it is a language that's evolving, but it's not a language that's trying to catch up. It's a language that's trying to bring in a certain paradigm shift uh, into the Java community. Now, the beauty of this is, I don't think that it's the depth of Java, right? I don't, I'm not worried about Java dying because it's the strength of the Java virtual machine, right? If you think about what happened to C++, C++ didn't quite die, right? Um, there are still applications being developed in C++, but to me, one of the greatest benefits of C++, the contributions of C++, is that we were thinking about what this OOP is, now we don't even think about it. And, and I would say a major contribution of C++ is that it made a mass adoption of OOP into the community, right? And that is the, so what is the, uh, what is the big deal about Java? Java gives us this virtual machine concept, the automatic garbage collection, a memory management, a lot of these things, even though they were around for a long time, make no mistake, right? Smalltalk has been doing it. So C++ is not the language that invented OOP. Java is not necessarily the language that implemented a lot of these things, but Java brought it to the masses, right? We started using it. And that's a significant contribution that Java has brought now it's time for us to grow on and move on and mature and take advantage. But the beauty is, uh, the, 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 it's, it's a great value proposition. Groovy doesn't say, forget Java, come over here. Groovy says, mix and match and benefit. So what that means is, a part of the application may still be written in Java, where you have the benefit of static typing that you need. A part of the application could maybe be written in Groovy, where you can take advantage. So the story here is that you can mix it very well. So I think Java is live and healthy. It's not that we're worried about it dying, but we got more power on our hands. Um, I wouldn't say that is entirely true, right? Uh, the reason is, if I am writing code in Groovy, there are times when I want to write code in Java, especially if I have to interoperate with other third-party systems. right? And again, there may be layers of the code I have to write where I want a lot more very strict error checking. There are other umpty number of reasons why Java may be a better suited language, but it gives me the opportunity to mix and match them at will. Please. Um, coming from Oracle, right, coming from a platform vendor, I doubt that you can uh, create a platform in Groovy. If you, I mean, this is a big strength of Java. Java is not just client application. Java is a platform language. And at, even in 20 years, Google will not be a platform language. It's going to be an application language, a DSL language, at least what I believe. Right. So, so his comment is coming from a vendor point of view, as a as a database vendor, Oracle vendor. Um, you know, probably Java is a better suited language to build the core infrastructure, and maybe Groovy is more of a DSL specific language. You know, that may very well be the case until we are proven wrong, right? Uh, it, maybe Groovy will mature enough where we don't want to be using it, right? That's all up there. But certainly, you know, these languages have their own strengths, and the beauty is, I mean, the, what excites me the most is that we have a choice, right? But a few years ago, we didn't have that. 
it was it was it was clearly hey, so here's a fork you go this way for productivity you stay here for a lot more you know uh, code apis and strength of static uh, compile languages and so on and people really said i don't want this one i want this productivity that meant that you have to you know you have one or the other now you got the benefit of having both with these kind of integration stories and, and that is a, a, a that is an advantage so i'm not worried at all about the you know life of java it's only going to be stronger it's not something that's going to disappear or die away, but we can be more productive with it. Question, please. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I think I missed the first slide when you talked about what is a domain-specific language. So it's more of a basic question. So when you talk about metaprogramming and when you talk about DSL or a functional-specific language, what are we trying to achieve? What is the use case here? All right. So let's say, well, there are several of those, right? Uh, DSL itself, DSLs are not new. We have seen this for quite a while. A DSL allows us to write a certain interactive API in a way that is very expressive from the domain point of view, right? So you're able to be able to express some of these concepts in a way that a domain expert can easily specify these things. But at the same time, you want to be able to take those and interpret and run them in your application, right? And, and you know, take an example of make files, right? Those of who have been doing make, make is an example of DSL. The domain there is the build system, right? And so on. Um, but there are other applications where there may be a rule engine, right? A rule engine where a, a, a domain expert may sit there and say, well, if money comes in, here are rules that you have to go through before you accept this particular transaction in the financial industry or not. Now, these are people with financial background who understand these rules that you have to process, right? But how do they specify these rules? You don't want to disconnect between them specifying the rule and a programmer then writing a code for it. That, that doesn't give you as much agility, right? Because then you're taking their descriptions, and then you're sitting there and writing code. Imagine for a minute that they can take a very lightweight syntax and specify those rules, but then you're able to take that in and execute it, right? That gives you a lot more power. So that is the story of the DSL. That's the use case where you're giving the power to the domain experts to specify these rules and other things, but take that in and execute it as part of your application code. Uh -huh. Correct, absolutely, right? You, you have to. But the thing is, that's not the only DSL it can execute, right? But that's just one sample of the DSL. Now if I want to specify another game, another set of scores, I can keep writing them. So in the case of a rule-based engine for a financial sector, once I write a processing engine for the DSL, I've given a language, expressive language for my domain expert. They can sit there and change these rules based on those limited language syntax I've given them I don't have to write any more code, right? If you say, I should never write code, but it should execute, that's called voodoo programming. That's not going to work, right? So, but I'm going to write a code that intelligently processes it. In other words, you invented a language for them, a very limited language for them, that they can use to express their concerns. No, I, I don't expect domain experts to use Groovy. I expect the domain experts to use the language I've created for them, right? That is the DSL. And you do this all the time already. Come to my DSL talk, right? So the other thing is, what about metaprogramming? The metaprogramming basically is an ability for a program to evolve itself as you go on. A, a simple example of this is, this has been around for a while, right? AOP, aspect of programming. AOP gives you the ability to inject behavior into code and have cross-cutting concerns. The problem with AOP is, not that it is not a good concept, it's a very strong concept, where we do not have good tools to use it, right? You, you had a choice of using some, something like aspect J, which was yet another language that you had to learn and apply on top of the Java language. That's a lot of complexity, right? It's enormous amount of burden for developers to learn that extra thing and apply it in a sensible way. But metaprogramming says, sit back, relax, you're within the confines of the language you're familiar with, assuming you're familiar with that language, but it becomes extremely easy to apply it. Now, metaprogramming also greatly makes it easier for you to implement internal DSL, but it's just one use case. But there are several other things you can do with it as well. Please. Uh, so we've been talking about mix and match and multiple platform, multiple uh, language thing. So uh, now we, we are in a situation when we have, uh, let's say, 10 uh, modules in Groovy, another 10 in uh, Zython. So uh, where do you see the comprehensibility of the complete code going? That's a very good question, right? So good old words of Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. Right? So if you go in and completely hack your code, 
You can write bad code in Java already. You can write even worse code mixing these languages. So a certain amount of discipline is certainly needed. This is especially not only with mixing these languages, but also you know, taking advantage of metaprogramming and so on. You've got to have a certain amount of discipline in writing it. The second thing is, how do I comprehend this? You know, I've come from a, uh, you know, a, a more of a background these years where I rely greatly on test cases for expressing the behavior of my code. So if you look at my Groovy code and even my Java code these days, there's a very strong backing of test cases that play out a story and say, hey, look, this is what is happening. So a lot of times I look at these test cases to learn the behavior, and that's what I would be relying upon. And I want to emphasize that, right? It's not that I only write test case when I write Groovy or Ruby code, right? I've, I've realized the benefit of test-driven development. Now when I write my C-sharp code, when I write my Java code, when I write my C++ code, I rely on a TDD approach, and that becomes a very expressive way. So you could use some of those things to communicate. But again, your goal is not to just write one line in Java and one line in Groovy. You would have an architectural you know, uh, uh, underpinning that says, OK, these are the areas that deserve this benefit. And clearly, when you enter that zone, it should be clear to you. That's an architectural decision you have to take. And, and so it becomes comprehensible. So you know, it's one thing to write code. The other thing is to design your software. That doesn't go away. It's, it's, it's as much important, if not more, as it used to be before. Go ahead, please. So the question is, how different are these different languages, right? The, let's leave the GUI for a minute. Let's come back to that. The goal of JRuby is to take your Ruby code and run it within JVM, right? You may say, why? The reason is for performance, number one. Second is a deployment story. You may be really excited about Ruby, but your organization says, good luck, but our deployment is in Java. Now this gives an opportunity for you to take your Ruby code and deploy it on your JVM, right? So it gives you a nice integration deployment story. So the real intent of Ruby is to, uh, JRuby is to take the Ruby developers and take advantage of Java, right? So when you're writing JRuby code, you are writing Ruby syntax. Same thing with Python, right? If you're a Python programmer, you're gonna write Python code to it. The reason I know Ruby is, Groovy story is a bit different. The GUI is, is, is one language where it says you could write Java code in GUI, but you can take advantage of dynamic capabilities, metaprogramming, and all that. So your GUI code is half Java code, but that kind of begins to look a little differently. So if you're a Java programmer and you don't program in Ruby, you don't program in Python, but you want to take advantage of the dynamic capabilities, GUI is a nice path. Because then you can use Java and start translating it. If you're a Ruby programmer and don't care about Java as much, I would say it's better to look at JRuby if you want to deploy on J, uh, JVM. If you're a Python programmer, you're better off looking at Jython. Right? That's the beauty. So Groovy is more for Java programmers to take advantage of dynamic capabilities than other programming language people. Excuse me. So if you take a first class Ruby code, is what you're saying? Right. You're taking Groovy code. Yes. Well, let's take a look at it, right? So let's just see what happens. Um, if I take a pure Groovy code itself, so here's my uh, little code that I'm going to write over here. Uh, where's that? Somewhere here. Okay. So so I'm going to say class, you know, uh, you know, my class. And I'm just going to write a method foo, right? And that's all I have, print foo, right? That's all I have. This is purely a little Groovy code. So all that I'm going to do is I'm just going to compile this code into, into Java bytecode. That, uh, that's all I'm going to do. So let's go back to the terminal here. And um, OK, so and uh, so now, fair enough, that's my class, right? That's what you would expect to see over here. So if I say Java P minus C my class, let's put it to a file. Look at it. So this is the code that got created. And if you notice, it is a class, first of all, right? 
So it's a class. It extends the object, obviously because it's Java. It implements Ruby object. And you scroll down to the foo method. It is a foo method as you would expect in Java, right? So that's basically what it is. It's simply a method that is going to be implemented just like in Java. It's just a bytecode representation, right? So at the end of the day, when it gets compiled, it is Java code behind the scene, right, in Java bytecode. So yeah, it's a lot more code, looks like, right? But that's because a lot of groovy details are in there to enable other things, including metaprogramming. But it's just that it came from a different language. But at the end of the day, it's bytecode, right? So that's all you're dealing with. Excuse me. Um, in, ter in terms of overhead, right? Um, well, yes, so there are certainly benchmarks available out there. As of GUI 1.5, GUI was performing slower than Java, right? GUI 1.6 has an enormous amount of performance implementation in it. So, but at the end of the day, you are going to not perform as much in GUI as you do in Java, at least not yet. But again, remember, this is an evolutionary language, right? So if performance is a very important thing to you, uh, you know, try out a few things and make sure that it is being a problem. If it's not being a problem, don't waste, waste your time on it. If performance is definitely a problem in those cases, then switch over and use Java in those cases, in those parts, and use Groovy in other places or other languages that you want to use in other places. So don't just look at performance benchmarks as a raw information, because it's always misleading, right? I don't want the best performance ever. Right? I want performance where I really need it. The, the crude analogy is, don't tell me that your car runs at 700 miles an hour when I can only drive at 40 miles an hour in my city. Right? So I don't care about ultimate performance. I care about what kind of productivity I get. But in, if I'm going to be in a race car, yes, that is important. Don't give me a, you know, a clunker that's going to only make 40 miles an hour. So it depends on what your application is doing. See, one of the common problems that can be found in DSL is to identify issues and debug issues, actually. So in how matured uh, Groovy on that front, actually? If there are some issues, if I keep my business logic in Groovy, if there are some issues, how can I identify that? So the question is, what kind of capabilities do I have to debug my Groovy code if I start doing serious things with it? Is that a good? OK. First of all, two, two things. Um, I don't deb debug my code because I don't write code with bugs, right? Just kidding. Well, the point I'm making is, you don't want to approach debugging as a way to develop a software. Uh, I want to emphasize that, because a, a test-driven approach is a much more effective way than debugging your code. That's one answer. Having given that answer, if you want to debug your Groovy code and Java code, you can seamlessly debug your Java code and step through it as much as you can seamlessly debug and step through your Groovy code as well. Right? One of the best tools out there today is IntelliJ IDEA, which has a JetGroovy plugin. You can have Java code and Groovy code sitting next to each other, put breakpoint in Java code, put breakpoint in Groovy code, click and say step through, and it naturally steps through both the code. You, won't, you will even forget that you're debugging through Java code versus Groovy code. It's pretty seamless. So there's absolutely no difference. If you had asked this question several months ago, my answer would have been different. But right now, you have the capability, at least within that IDE. Other IDEs are catching up to the, to the place right now. Please. I have a question. Uh, in one of the slides, you showed that uh, you can receive a script and you can run it through your Java code. So uh, what kind of security risks it poses, and how does it fit into enterprise applications? Very good question. So the question is, hey, you can grab a script and execute it. Uh, excuse me, but what about security, right? So the beauty is, at the end of the day, it's Java code that's running, right? So what you do is you can sandbox it. You can set up privileges on it and say, I'm going to give you the least privilege possible, and I'm going to have you run it. So you're absolutely right. You've got to be concerned about security. But what you do is you take that particular code and say, I'm going to lower your capabilities. You don't have access to the file system if I don't want to give you access to the file system, right? So you can start withdrawing all these capabilities, give it the minimum credential, and say, go run it. And that's your responsibility to do it. But then after doing that, it's got as much security and limitations capability as Java code does, right? So if you ask me, hey, Venkat, if you are getting a DLL, right, and executing it, or in the case of Java, you're getting a jar from somebody and calling into it, what kind of security do I have on it? It's exactly the same answer, right? So if I'm getting a third party call, jar and I'm going to call into it, I can limit, I can sandbox it, you can do the same things. Right? So it's, at the end of the day, it's Java code you're running, and you can limit the capabilities of it. And yes, you have to do that as well. Please. So if I'm making use of such a function, such a library in Java, so 
The question is, hey, closure is a great concept these dynamic languages are supporting, but Java doesn't do it as of today, what's going on? Um, I would say Java P minus C is a great way to look at it. So if you run Java, let's do this real quick, right? Just as a quick example, I'll show you what's happening. Even we don't have to go to that level. All that I have to do here simply is to look at what this tool is doing, right? So if you notice over here, uh, if I go to um, the uh, code I wrote here, let's just throw in a function. So basically, it turns out into an anonymous inner class, right? Oops, I think I lost power here. So is that the way to say that I should shut up? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is to just throw a closure into this. So basically, if I'm going to call a function, let's say I'm call, going to call a function list.each. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to say list.each, and I'm going to simply call a closure into this, right? I'm going to say print ed as a, as a real simple example right there. Now, if I go back over here and compile this code, um, switch over here, uh, okay. So um, compile this code, groovy C, Oops, test.groovy. So um, you can see that test dollar underscore run closure one. So basically, this is again the state of what it is right now. So groovy basically treats your closures as anonymous inner classes for you, right? That's what it's doing. And that may change eventually when Java implements closures, right? There's discussions about Java having closures itself it possibly could change. But that's the beauty is that they smartly found out ways to take advantage of these things that map to what you're already familiar, thank you, what you're already familiar with. Hello, uh, I have a question here. Please. Hello? Yes. The exception flow. Um, so, good news all the way through. The exception handling mechanism is exactly the same in Groovy as it is in Java. Having said that, Java adamantly will ask you to handle exceptions that you don't care about. What Groovy does is it says, if you don't want to handle this exception, don't. We will put a block around it, a try block around it. So of course, if you don't handle exception, it gets propagated down the chain, right? and eventually something is going to catch it. Here's a trivial example for you, right? If you are trying to call into a Groovy code, um, something like this, uh, sorry, if you're calling to a Java code, something like this, if, uh, you know, keep it extremely trivial. All that I'm going to do here is simply say thread dot sleep, and I'm going to say, let's say 2000. You just can't do that in Java, right? Because Java is going to say, hey, wait a minute, you got to put a lousy try catch block around it and catch the thread interrupt exception, even though you don't give a you know, damn about it, right? Groovy says, don't waste your time, right? Just go ahead and run it. Well, what if this uh, code does throw thread interrupted exception? Well, it's going to you know, get propagated to the caller of this code, just like it would happen in Java if you had put a catch and did a throw on it, right? So the story is exactly the same, just that Java, uh, Groovy eliminates that unnecessary ceremony so you don't have to waste your time. So it's as if that you put a catch block and propagate it up the chain. That's exactly what Groovy is going to do. Um, from the performance enhancement point of view, does this mix and match uh, in any way improve the performance? Uh -huh. um, does it improve the performance? I would not, I, I don't expect it to, right? Because the reason why you mix and match these is not to really gain the performance. It depends on what performance we talk about. Performance of the program versus productivity of your developers, right? So, so I'm not going to go use and mix and match these languages for the sake of performance. I'm going to mix in these languages for the sake of productivity, right? Another reason I may do this is I can do something very quickly, go show it to the users, get a feedback, and come back and say, that's not what they want. It's not waste of our time doing it. Let's go change it to something else. And then once I realize, hey, that's what they want, sometimes I may even go backtrack it and re-implement parts of it in Java to get a better performance. So no, I wouldn't be going to these for improving performance. I'll be going to these for improving productivity more than anything else. Uh, the other way around, like there are two engines running, one is the JVM and the other is the Groovy engine. So there is no Groovy engine. Okay. There is absolutely no Groovy engine. That's the beauty. There is absolutely no Groovy engine. You write Groovy code, every line of Groovy code is compiled into Java bytecode, runs within the JVM. Groovy code is, let's make this clear, Groovy code is never ever interpreted. There is absolutely no interpretation. When you say Groovy and type the name of the file to run, Groovy literally calls Groovy C. 
compiles your Ruby code into Java bytecode, executes your Java bytecode. There is no interpretation, there's no Groovy engine. You are dealing with Java bytecode, Java Can we say machine. that uh, if there is no performance enhancement, at least there's no reduction in performance? Uh, I cannot say that either, right? Because you are dealing with a Groovy compiler translating your Groovy code into Java bytecode. So you could take a Java code, take a very simple Java code, compile it into uh, bytecode using the Java compiler. The Java compiler is pretty optimized as of today. You take the same Java code, compile it using Groovy compiler. The bytecode you get is not as efficient as of today. It, you know, true that we're not comparing apples to apples, right? Because Groovy does a few things for enabling other things like metaprogramming and so on, so it's not a fair comparison. But ignoring that, you know, lack of fairness, no, it's not the same bytecode. So yes, there is a difference in performance. But the question is, is the difference in performance going to kill me? And the answer is, most of the time, it doesn't. It depends on what you're trying to do, right? And that's why I want to emphasize, do not look at performance and say, oh my goodness, this is slower. Ask yourself, what are you doing with it? If it is of no consequence, you are wasting your time and productivity gains for a theoretical performance gain that you don't care about, right? So be very prudent and pragmatic about it rather than being dogmatic about performance, right? That's the way to look at it, please. The rules that could be written for a uh, finance, uh, this thing, how, how does it um, compete with already existing rule engines? Because uh, if I see some of the rule engines that exist, uh, a domain expert can load rules in inside that rule engine so that it can execute. Right. So how does it compete with uh, Groovy? So, so the goal of Groovy is not to replace those rule engines, right? Um, sometimes in my applications, Right. Uh, I may be writing a DSL which has nothing to do with the rule itself. This could be a input that coming that's coming in, nothing to do with nothing to do with rule processing. So a DSL is broader than rules, right? A rules is one example of a DSL, but DSLs are not for rules, right? I mean, you see what I'm saying? Rules is an example of a DSL, but DSL is not an example of rules. There are other plenty of other things you do with DSLs, right? Uh, and, and you may have, you know, for example, my test cases, I may specify a few test cases that could be interpreted. I may have, wherever you are using XML configuration files, they may be translated into DSLs. They are rules, they are your configuration data, but they are being consumed as DSLs and they are executed by your code, right? Take the example of uh, Grails. Grails implements, uh, uses GORM, where GORM gives you a database mapping. That's a DSL, not a rule, right? So a DSL is broader than rules. So, it, there's, so if you're asking me how a DSL competes with rule engine, it doesn't, right? Because a rule engine and rules processing is one subset of what you may use DSL for. It may not even be a DSL. So it's more like a two circles like, like this, right? There's this narrow area of over, over, uh, overlap, rather. And you have the rule processing, which is broader, and you have DSL, which is broader, right? So there's, there's no very small overlap between the two. Bingat, I have a question regarding DSLs. What do, you what do you see are the challenges in involving a DSL versus involving an API which does the same thing? Uh, API and DSLs are very different from each other, right? No need to confuse the two of them. The reason is, the purpose of a DSL is to provide an expressive syntax for somebody to interface with your running application. Right, so my question is that when you're writing a DSL, you better know the domain very well because you're providing a sort of language which helps the business user to express whatever he's trying to do. Can I step so, back for a minute? Yeah. If you're writing an application, you better know your domain very well. Right. End of story. Right? No different, right? Because I have no business coding for a company and I say, I don't have a clue what you guys do, but I'm going to code. Right, so when you evolve a DSL, is it is it like is it similar to evolving an API? No, it's it's more intense. Right. Because now you have to sh make sure that the people who are using it are able to express their jargons the way they are. Right. The the the, the, the way to look at it is how do your users communicate with your user interface, not the programming API, but the user interface. This is another form of UI, right? User interface, not a GUI, but a UI. And so everything that you do in developing a UI, 
visual aspects of things in a GUI, more of the interactive and expressive aspects in the case of DSL. It's, it's a similar but not the same, but the challenges are in interfacing with the system, not an API level. Okay, and, uh, another quick question. This is regarding something that we all use and love, which is refactoring. How does it stand with scripting languages like Ruby? Very good question. Before I go further, how are we doing on time? I don't want to I hold them hostage. Keep going? All right, fantastic. That's great. So the, 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 that's a fantastic question, by the way. And I'm going to give you kind of a lame answer to that question. And the reason is refactoring is much more stronger today in the Java community, right? And the reason is you have tools like IntelliJ IDEA and Eclipse that do an awesome job, right? And then the reason, in fact, the, the refactoring, even though it was kind of invented and created as part of a C++ you know, the dissertation, Java took, took off because IntelliJ guys, really smart, the brain guys, really smart, they uh, you know, uh, uh, entered into the AST manipulation and they did an awesome amount of refactoring. Um, that is one area where a certain amount of static typing actually helps you. Refactoring is quite lame when it comes to dynamic languages. But having said that, right, this is from my own personal experience, uh, not only refactoring but also the intelligence kind of things, I feel that I need that a lot more when I code in Java and C Sharp. I tend to need that a lot lesser in the case of dynamic languages. One of the reasons is, I'm not saying you don't need it, right, but the reason is the code size is a lot more smaller, right? I take a lot more defensive steps in writing this code, keep them extremely small, so I have a lesser need for it, but that doesn't eliminate the need completely, but it's not come to a point where I give up on these languages because of that. But also, the good news is, if you ask this, so to kind of compare to the question he asked, and I told him, if you have this question months ago, it'll be a different answer. Ask that question again a few months from now, it may be a different answer, right? Because a great amount of work is being done by these tool vendors, and to a certain extent, Certain amount of refactoring and intelligence is happening today than it did a few months ago, but not entirely adequate and up to snuff with Java, but that's changing as we speak. So maybe a year from now, that will be a very different story. But yeah, certainly you're absolutely right. That's one of the lacking areas, but it's not dire either. Thanks. Are there any testing frameworks available? Actually, Groovy not only has a testing as, as an example, right? Groovy not only has a testing framework, it has a fantastic integration with JUnit and TestNG. And also it gives you a lot more capability. So testing is not only uh, more important in, the, in these dynamic languages, testing is actually easier. Also, it's very easy to create mock objects in these dynamic languages. So to, and again, mocking is very useful for testing purposes, so it's easier to test the code with these languages also. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation, sir. As you said that there is no separate interface, uh, there is no interpretation of the Groovy code, or there is no search engine. Uh, only the advantage of Groovy is that it's having the dynamic, uh, dynamic capability. Okay, what do you see the future of Groovy five to ten years down the line in this industry? Will it replace the existing technology or? I did not bring my crystal ball with me, so I cannot look into it and tell you what it's going to be in ten years. Um, I would, if you ask me, this is where. I will tell you that I'm not a language fanatic. I am extremely shameless when it comes to languages. I code in C Sharp, C++, Java, Ruby, Groovy, uh, uh, different like VB, name it, right? And to me, I really don't care at the end of the day what a language can do today. If 10 years from now a better language exists, I'm ready to pick it up and move on. So Java has given us the path, and that's the reason I'm not adamant to sticking with Java. If Groovy is a better choice, if JRuby is a better choice, I'm willing to move on. And yes, Groovy is a great language, no doubt about it. I love using it. But if there are other better languages that are going to serve the need in 10 years from now, I'm going to move on. So I turn the question around. Rather than saying how strong Groovy is going to be in 10 years, I'm going to ask how strong am I going to be in 10 years to take those languages and move on and apply it. Right? The strength is in my ability to comprehend and implement solutions to my companies and organizations. The strength is not in the language and me being adamant about sticking to it. Right? So, so that's what I would say. I don't know. That's too broad and, and, and long to know what's going to happen. If you ask to the, 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 the Groovy community and the developers, they will say, oh, yeah, it's going to be strong. But that's what everybody wants to do. 
But again, a lot of things we don't know what's going to happen, right? Too many things could go on, uh, and languages can come and go. Uh, there is actually, if you really look, about, look back in history, there is about 10 years lifetime for any language. Java actually exceeded that right now. It's in its 13th year, right? Um, so it's already beyond its, its lifetime. So about 10 years, we keep getting new languages. There's a, a Google for history of programming languages. And look at the lifetime of languages. You see the, the maturity and then the real excitement on languages stay for about 10 years, and then we move on. And I certainly hope that's the case with Groovy, right? I, I, I love it. I want to use it. But I don't want to be married to it forever, right? I want to go on and look at something else that's maybe better later on. Please. Your feeling is absolutely justified, right? Um, it does take an enormous amount of time and capability and effort to keep up with multiple languages. Make no mistake about it, right? But uh, having said that, it is not that everybody in the project must maintain every piece of code. You could have a certain set of people maintaining a certain area of code, certain other people maintaining certain other area of code, depending on what you're doing. But there could be a few people who can transcend that very easily, right? It would be nice, ideally, for everybody to do everything else. But what do I do, right? As much as I would love to do everything, at the end of the day, I'm not good at writing database-specific code. So what do I do? I throw in a little bit of code, and then I go to somebody I respect and say, please help me refactor this now. That's not where my strength is. So I don't have to be an expert in all the languages. I can be an expert in a select language, know a little bit about other things. But I have smart people with me who can help me and, and work with me. So that is the way I would want to approach it, right? Get up and running, and then you can seek the help to improve it. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, the constant maintenance will always be related to the capable people you find. So there is that concern, but hopefully it, it's offset by the other gains that you get. If it doesn't, you've got to address it, certainly. Please. Um, I don't think uh, that actually implies at all. You are still your architectural concerns, design concerns still prevail, right? If you have something that needs to be done on the client side, you still are going to do this on the client side. You're not going to move that to the server side for being done. Oh, uh, for a number of reasons, right? Just because it's on the server side doesn't mean it doesn't change. Here's an example. Um, let's say a company deals with uh, insurance policies. Their server is the one that processes this, but the rules are specified and evolves by the day. Just because of the server side doesn't mean it doesn't change, right? You may be interacting with this on the client side, but the rules may exist still on the server side. And you still want to modify this. You don't want to call the programmer every day and say, go write this code for me. Yeah, so, so again, architectural things, design things still are valid. These are tools, right? And I need to know when these tools can be used. This is not a recommendation that you have to use the tool. The recommendation that here's a tool for you, so if you do decide to use it, take advantage of it. But, 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 but you have to still apply those, those concerns, uh, absolutely. I think we should go get some lunch, what do you think? Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Thank you for extending your lunch break, which means to say your lunch break is shortened. 1.20, you'll have to assemble at the halls for your 1.30 session.